And you're trying to give the young people something that will help them. Yet you don't know exactly what it ought to be. Welcome back to the Teach Thought Podcast. My name is Drew Perkins, and I'm the Director of Professional Development here at Teach Thought. I'm excited to announce something we've been working on in response to a large number of requests that we get from individuals. Most of the work that we do around the world is on-site at schools who bring us to work with their staff. But we do get lots of requests and emails from individual teachers who are looking for services or leaders who are looking for services. So in response to that, we're developing and we'll be offering a number of events outside of our summer conference, which has been going on for three years now, our GROW series. So as of right now, if you go to wegrowteachers.com forward slash events, you'll see one event listed with more to come. Friday, October 18th, we will be offering a leadership PBL, Developing a Sustainable Project-Based Learning Implementation Plan Workshop, where school leaders can come together and develop a better understanding of project-based learning so that they can support teachers. Also, in that process, you will develop a short and long-term implementation plan to get you started on a sustainable PBL implementation. And think about the systems and practices and curriculum pieces that you might want to change to better support that, as well as clarifying and aligning the work with your mission and purpose and vision so that your professional development is more meaningful. So I encourage you to, again, go to wegrowteachers.com forward slash events. As always, we encourage you to share our podcast and our blog and our events and anything related to Teach Thought Professional Development. Our mission is to help you better educate and prepare students for the modern world and refine your teaching craft in doing that. So we always encourage you to share anything you think is meaningful and helpful with your network and friends in ways that might help them do the same. In this podcast episode, I spoke with Chris Wobie and Mia Dubasarski, who work at the Worcester Polytechnic Institute in New England. They work with their students and pre-K through 12 teachers around project-based learning and STEM education. And I saw a video, I believe, several maybe a couple months ago that showed them doing project-based learning work which I think unfortunately is all too rare at the post-secondary level so I asked them if they would come on the podcast and of course they did and we had a great conversation around some things that are we have in common in thinking about building a culture and the importance of authenticity We did talk a fair amount around grading and group work, which I think is really important, as well as the role of knowledge, the importance of building an infrastructure and supporting faculty, some of the differences between process and product grading, and the attributes of their PBL instructors and pieces around doing project-based learning with high quality. So... Interesting conversation for me, always good to share with fellow PBL practitioners, and I hope it helps you become a better teacher. Welcome to the podcast. I have Chris Wobie and Mia Dubasarski from Worcester Polytechnic Institute up in New England, and they say Worcester instead of Worcester, as some people around the country and around the world might say, but uh, I'm sure you're probably tired of hearing that joke. But uh, welcome to the podcast, both of you. I'm excited to talk with you about project-based learning at the not only the K-12 and STEM uh, perspective, but at the higher ed, which as uh, many folks are woefully aware that that this is probably lacking, or at least the perception that project-based learning is lacking in the uh, post-secondary world is uh, is a reality. But we're going to talk about that and uh, and more. But before we do, Chris and uh, Mia, go ahead and introduce yourselves, and then we'll kind of go from there. 
Thank you. So I, this is Chris Wobey, and I am the co-director for WPI's Center for Project-Based Learning. But I've been a faculty member at WPI since 1995. I started in biochemistry, and um, because WPI is so project-centric, I, I um, quickly became a strong believer, and I'm really excited now to be working in the center where we work with faculty here at WPI and at other institutions to bring project-based learning into their courses and curricula. Okay, great. Mia? And I'm Mia Dwosarski. I'm the Director of Professional Development at the STEM Education Center here at WPI. And I've been a science and STEM educator for probably about 25 years, um, working with kids and teachers in the uh, informal education setting as well as formal education. Uh, but since my um, completion of the doctorate in science education about uh, eight, nine years ago, I really focused on working with um, educators, both teachers and administrators. Um, and through the center here, we've been uh, working with uh, thousands of educators um, at WPI as well as in schools and districts. Okay, great. Well, I want to get an overview of the institution in which you both work, which is WPI. So if you can give me a little bit of a rundown of, of what kind of, I guess, just the, 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 the broad strokes of WPI. I know you said before we started recording that you shifted to project-based learning about 50 years ago which lots of folks probably think that project-based learning is new, but it is certainly not. So give us a little bit of an overview of WPI, if you would. Sure. So WPI is a mid-sized, primarily STEM school, as you might guess, from the Polytechnic Institute part of the name. Um, and so we have a lot of engineers and scientists in a business school, but um, as as Drew mentioned, in the early 1970s, WPI became very concerned um, about the, the institutional situation and decided they really needed to do something different. And so they threw out their entire very lockstep engineering-based curriculum and radically altered it so that the foundation of the whole curriculum were projects. And there were we have two degree requirement projects one in the senior year that's a senior capstone and is a nine credit hour experience um, totally outside of classes where students are working in their major to demonstrate their knowledge of their subject material the other major degree requirement project also outside of courses is another nine credit experience typically done in the junior year where students work with organizations um, both in Worcester and around the world to solve some problem at the intersection of society, technology, uh, or engineering. And that was very intentional because we wanted our students to recognize that the decisions they made as professionals were going to have real impacts out in the world. And also that the world that they lived in had a large um, influence on the types of decisions that they made. Um, but since then, um, we still retain those degree requirements, but we've also seen projects sort of infuse courses so that at this point, about 85% of our faculty say that they have put projects within their courses. Um, and we, we're really excited by that. I mean, I think it's a real demonstration of the power of project-based learning that faculty recognized how valuable it was and were willing to, to put it into their courses for that. And so at this point, here we are in central Massachusetts with about 5,000 undergraduate students. 90% um, of them go to project centers somewhere around the world to do their projects. And, you know, we recruit a great group of students who are very socially minded. That's a little bit about WPI. I would add maybe that um, another component of um, the shift in curriculum um, is, is building a culture of uh, taking risks and trying new things. So the grading system of WPI is something that is quite unique, I would say, in the higher education world. So um, students cannot fail courses here. They can get an A, a B, or a C, or something we call an NR, which is no record, um, which is literally no record that they ever took a class. 
So if this was done to really kind of take the stress a little bit away from grades and more on the content and the learning experience and really encourage students to go outside of their comfort zone to try new things uh, without, you know, thinking about their, um, you know, GPA or average. Um, so students absolutely cannot on their and are their way to graduation. So if this is a core course, they have to repeat it. But the, the culture and the climate is, you know, try something new, take risks, and, and maybe you'll find, you know, a new passion of yours. Hmm. Well, that's fascinating. A, B, C, or no record. And I definitely want to touch on some of the assessment pieces because I do think that the assessments that we often see in every educational setting it doesn't really square very well with the organic listen uh, learning that that project-based learning can really help with and you know I sometimes talk about friction points and that is certainly one of them um, but but I'm gonna come back I want to get to the, the assessment pieces as we dive a little bit more into this um, as, as I'm thinking about that shift 50 years ago and I can imagine and you articulated a few things of, of why that shift felt necessary, but I'm wondering if you, I'm assuming the, the way that you that you said that uh, description was that your professors, your in, uh, instructors are starting to incorporate more of them into the process of the class, not just as capstones. And is the, if that is, assuming that's a fairly recent development, why you think that has not happened earlier and then maybe more importantly why you why you think it's starting to take hold more recently well i think the the diffusion of projects into courses has been sort of over time um and i don't i'm not entirely sure that it's all that recent okay i know when i started here um in 95 um, I was teaching, a, I was asked to teach a very traditional biochemistry course. Um, and interestingly, it was the biochemistry course that when I took it as a bio, as a chemistry major, uh, as an undergraduate, it was the course that made me decide I was never going to be a biochemist. Now, obviously I got a PhD in biochemistry, so I, I, I did eventually take more biochemistry courses, but having to teach that course that I hated taking because it was, uh, a dash through memorization of any number of things that seemed totally disconnected from anything important mm -hmm. um, allowed me to be able to step back from that content and say, why am I teaching this? And how do I help my students see that some of this stuff really is important? And three years later, I had built a project into the course. Um, and I, you know, so that was 98. So that course is still has that project into it in to this day. And I no longer teach it. So that was 20 years ago. And I don't think that was the only course that had projects into it at that time. So I think um, students like projects, projects um, give them opportunities to show their knowledge and um, perform well outside of a test environment. And test environments are really very artificial in terms of the, the kinds of performances that students are going to be asked to do outside of schools. Um, so I, they encourage faculty to put projects into their courses. Um, and about 14 years ago, 15 years ago, WPI took a look. And one of the places the projects still weren't where they weren't in our curriculum was pretty much in the first year. And um, we knew that students came and didn't like that. We advertise ourselves as being a very project-based institution. And so they come hoping to do projects and we're told not yet. We got to wait a year. Um, and also we were getting results back from the national survey of student engagement that our first year students were incredibly not engaged in their schoolwork, where our seniors were incredibly engaged in their work. And the big difference is a project. 
Um, we also figured we could do a better job of help, helping to prepare our students for these big degree requirement projects if we got them immersed in a smaller, lower stakes project earlier on. And so we developed a first year course um, or set suite of courses called Great Problem Seminars, where we take first year students um, and give them an opportunity to work on a project. So each of the courses has at its heart one of the world's big problems, food, energy, education, health care, um, creating livable cities, climate change. And you know, students can almost always find one of those that they're interested in. And then those courses are co-taught and we intentionally pick faculty from very different fields. And wherever possible, we try and put a scientist or an engineer with a humanist. And those two faculty work with that group of students, and it can be as many as you know, 50 students in one of these courses to explore the breadth and depth of that problem from a variety of perspectives, both disciplinary perspectives. So I taught one um, on food and hunger. As a biochemist, there's an obvious link to food is nutrition and micronutrients and plants need nutrition so that we can get the zinc we need from the food we eat. Um, but also we had to talk about the economics of food uh, availability and accessibility and government policies related to what do farmers produce and why, um, as well as the social justice issues of access to food. So, you know, between myself and the other faculty member, we sort of look at all of those things, as well as the different perspectives of what is it like if you are, you know, a person in Worcester with a reasonable income or a, or a meal plan, and how is your food situation different than somebody somewhere else under very different circumstances? Um, and after we do that exploration for a while, then we ask the students to get into teams and pick one small piece of a food problem, propose a solution, come up with an implementation plan, devise an assessment plan, and present this in a very public forum where we invite the entire campus and alumni come back and judge and we bring in parents and deans and presidents and invite the entire campus. And that has been a very successful introduction to projects for those students. Um, when we've been, you know, that program started, this is the 14th year of it. So we're continually uh, adding to our project-based curriculum here in ways that we think help our students um, both learn content and prepare them for the workforce. Mm. So, uh, and Mia, and I, I, I want to get your your thinking on this in, in a context as well for STEM. But how do you define project based learning, and do you think it's any different from some of the other ways that are that that project based learning uh, folks like ourselves might think of it? Uh, what what is there anything in particular that makes your PBL different or special? So in the pre K twelve uh, world, so so the, our center really focuses on quality STEM education, um, which I would say is, is probably eighty or eighty five percent aligned with high quality PBL. Um, the difference, obviously, is the kind of the context of the STEM um, subject. So when we're looking at high quality STEM, um, I usually, because we work with both teachers and kind of large school systems, I differentiate between successful STEM or project-based experience in the classroom and successful implementation of STEM or project or PBL at the school or district or you know, even a country level. Um, so if we have time, I'm happy to talk about both. Um, so at the classroom level, I think we, uh, the hardcore of PBL or the hardcore of, of STEM in that case is really to have a problem. Uh, problem has to be open-ended. It has to be rooted with um, the, the content or the standards. Um, and it has to be authentic, uh, something that the students can, you know, hear um, about when they read the news um, or listen to the radio and something that is they can really 
bring all their ideas and creativity um, and content knowledge to solve that. Um, having that problem be rooted in the standards or in the core content really ensures that it's not something that is done after teaching, but something that is originates from the core ideas and practices that are being taught in that class. So the, the problem and the problem solving skills are key to that. Um, other things um, would be definitely the, the group work, ensuring individual accountability uh, within the group work. It's not just putting students in groups and letting them, you know, telling them to, hey, go and solve this problem, but mm -hmm. uh, really teaching them the required skills for successful group work and making sure that each one of them can be accountable for the uh, work of the group. Um, so uh, we definitely talk about in high quality connection to non-STEM, uh, that's in STEM education, but in general or in PBL, you know, that can happen in every um, other content. And we are looking for students to be uh, reading, to be writing, to be communicating, to be speaking and presenting because communication skills are really key to sharing um, ideas with other audiences that may not have the content knowledge. So this is uh, part of that. Um, we want students to be using the tools that are authentic to that problem, and it can be digital or non-digital tools. Um, and um, just connection to real world and careers. I would say these, these are the keys to having a successful project. Chris, would you? Oh, absolutely. I, you know, the, the authenticity provides a lot of the motivation and, and the willingness of the students to work hard. And if we look at the institution kind of level, um, there are five things that um, we are uh, working with schools and districts and again, even larger um, at the country level um, for people to try and, and build toward. I would say the first one is really having the infrastructure um, to support PBL or to support STEM education. And that includes, you know, um, having a vision and um, a plan to do that, having the budget, um, having the resources and materials if needed. The second is really important um, of building a climate or a culture that supports PBL um, and having all stakeholders kind of, um, you know, buy into that vision um, and um, it's okay to try new things. It's okay to fail. You know, this is part of problem solving. And this is something that should be at the institution level. The third and um, really, really important is supporting the faculty or supporting the teachers and not just saying, okay, we are shifting to project base or we're shifting to STEM, go do that. Um, but really recognizing that these educators are the ones that um, will carry the change, so they need to be empowered and prepared and supported and provided with the time and resources that they need. Um, and then the other two include the learning experience itself to make sure it's high quality, as well as uh, partnerships, because no PBL and no STEM can um, be done in isolation. It's usually building partnerships between um, the school, um, and the community and nonprofits and industry and business. So these are kind of my big five for in institutional success of STEM or PBL. Right, and I, th I would agree um, as a fellow PD provider because you all not only do work with PBL and STEM in your institution, but you also help others. Those are some of the things that we try to help uh, leaders really think about, right? So the climate and culture and and infrastructure and, and thinking about this as a process, not as a one-time kind of, like you said, we're going to, we're going to do PBL now, or we're going to do STEM now and go kind of thing. And, and that it is a process. Uh, I did want to linger if, if we can, before we go into other things, because I do think it's a really interesting and sometimes not talked about enough dynamic is, is the idea of group work and teamwork. And I would imagine as, as 
in my thinking, as kids get older from elementary to middle to high to post-secondary, I think that there's probably a an increasing unwillingness or uh, dissatisfaction with having to work in groups in lots of cases because so often they tend to be sort of dysfunctional and not a there's not a level of accountability across the the group members there's often of course one person who thinks they're doing more or more people some people thinking they're doing more and some some of their slackers and some of that might be perception some of its reality but when you all think about teaching students how to work in groups what kinds of things do you do that you found successful that has been a real focus of uh, our work here at WPI, um, and particularly in our Great Problem Seminars where we're working with the first year students. Um, because you're right, a lot of them come to WPI and um, they've had bad group experiences. Many of them have been the one who, they, who felt like they had to do all of the work. For many of them, they actually liked it that way. Right, right. <laughs> happy to take charge and, and do all the work. Um, but when you get four chiefs and no, um, you know, followers, that doesn't work very well either. And so particularly in the first year program, we've spent a good deal of time um, and are actually doing some real research on um, getting students to work effectively and equitably in teams. And it requires that we do some really explicit instruction about what good teamwork is. And there's some great resources out there. The Association of American Colleges and Universities has a set of rubrics um, that they've made available, that they've, they've tested and um, are validated instruments. And one of them is on teamwork. And it's a beautiful thing. And it's available at their website. And I highly recommend it. Um, but one of the capstone um, level for teamwork is that you discuss and deal with conflict. And when, you know, we point this out to first year students, um, they're a little shocked because they think excellent group work means that there are no conflicts. And so (laughs) their first instinct is to pretend like everything's fine when it's not. Um, But we've gone further than that now. And through the work of two excellent faculty members here at WPI, um, professors, Jeff Stoddard, or Jeff Pfeiffer and Lisa Stoddard, um, they have been doing research on equitable teamwork and have arrived at uh, a suite of tools that we now deploy. And the first step is discussing with students that diversity on teams leads to better outcomes if all of the diversity is allowed to be expressed. And so we provide evidence that shows them that diverse teams produce better outcomes through short little papers. And then we talk about what is diversity. And we use some fairly low stakes examples of diversity like introverts, extroverts, and how they prefer to resolve conflicts. And then of course, point out that there are the more evident, you know, sort of identity based differences um, in, in diversity. And then we talk about implicit bias. And then we ask every member of a team to fill out individually an asset map. What are they bringing to this particular project from their personal background, their experiences, prior coursework, prior work, um, hobbies and interests that will help them on this project? And so they all do this individually. And then we spend time in class where the teams get together and they share their asset maps. This does a couple of things. One is it sort of makes um, the individuals on the team three-dimensional people. So instead of being identified as, you know, the football jock who probably isn't really interested in this team to someone who has a relative that has a disability. And so they're really very interested in this project that's going to help them figure out mobility issues for somebody right? Or any of those potential um, stereotypes that might fit in. And then the students are also asked to identify three areas that they want to grow in. 
And then as they go through the project experience, for every small piece of the project that they're working on, they are asked to identify who's going to be a leader from a strength base in, in that they have skills, abilities, interests, whatever, that are, are um, relevant to that particular part of the task. And who is going to be participating because they want to develop a they want to develop that particular skill or ability, and that um, tends to eliminate a lot of things like task assignment bias that that shows up quite strongly in a lot of project work. The students do complain that this is uh, a lot of extra work, but they also recognize that it's been really valuable for their team experience. Um, and what Jeff and Lisa have found through their research using these and reflections that students have produced after participating in these, that that slacker teammate is almost always a slacker teammate because of bad prior team experiences. And it might even have been within that team. If they feel like they're shut down or not listened to more than a few times, you know, their, their interest in participating wanes considerably as is totally understandable. Um, and so when students recognize that their behaviors can produce slackers, um, they have a better investment in not having that happen. And so we've seen better teamwork um, come as a result. So, you know, yes, it, teamwork is a, is a huge issue and it's something that needs to be addressed head on because it doesn't usually happen just by accident. Can, can I quickly add, uh so this is an, an amazing experience from the student perspective. Um, you know, they're getting to college and get to reflect on their assets and their strengths and weaknesses and really getting that experience during the first year is amazing because this is something that will serve them um, during the next four years. But working with teachers, we know that it's really also important for teachers to recognize the, you know, intentionality um, of creating groups and um, having putting students together and creating some um, group skill goals and teaching their students to reflect how important is that is and many teachers are not aware of that. So I have to give credit here to the great Roger Johnson, um, who was my graduate advisor, um, <laughs> who is really kind of with his brother David, the guru for cooperative learning. and. Um, we are building heavily on his work in helping teachers uh, kind of get to those uh, key component of helping their students develop group work skills and kind of through the uh, key elements of cooperative learning. Hmm. So one of the things that that struck me as you were talking, and, and when we think about group accountability, it's often in the context of, of grading, right? So either the, the group's work is suffering because there's a lack of output and involvement on one or more members, which then either lowers the quality of the out of, of the of the group work you know as a total output, or somebody or some people are having to do more. So in some way, sometimes we think about uh, we suggest and ask teachers to think about how, you might build in some systems to help them navigate that. And I would agree that we really want them to be able to navigate those hard decisions and, and have those hard conversations of, hey, you're not pulling your weight here, and let's show, let's talk about the evidence that you are or you're not. But in the end, if somebody doesn't pull their weight, we sometimes say, well, what can we do to, to hold kids accountable uh, learners accountable for the work that they are or are not doing. And one of the things that I suggest that I've found effective in my classroom when I was still teaching was to say, let's give the, the overall group a grade. And I usually use like, let, let's say I graded you at an 80%, uh, which uh, of course the underlying assumption there is you're using a 100% scale. And I don't know if that's what you all use, but lots of schools do. So if there's four members, you take 80 
multiply it times four, you have 320 points. Now I want the four of you to, to divide those points up, but the, the they have to equal 320, which means that everybody can get an 80 if everybody pulled their weight and you all agree with that. Or one person get a, can get 100, which means somebody is going to lose some points, maybe a 60 and the other two an 80, but that they have to ne negotiate that and figure that out hopefully based on the evidence and the, the the conversation around that evidence. But I'm not sure how that squares with your grading policies and uh, how if you might do something different. So, you know, again, it, at, a, at the college level, university level, there's um, a lot of freedom for faculty to do sort of what they think is right as long as it's clearly um, defined at the beginning of the course. Um, so I won't, I won't begin to say that this is um, a universal practice here at WPI. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that um, in the, I, I can tell you in the big degree projects, there's quite frequently a process grade as well as a product grade. And the faculty um, will work with the students, you know, this is, since it's a nine credit hour experience, they're, they're spending quite a bit of time with the faculty too in their, their teams. And you can see what is going on and, um, you know, they can give midterm feedback on this is what, and they ask the students actually to provide midterm feedback on their team process. Um, and they, they have discussions about that. And so, you know, one, one aspect is to have a process grade with lots of, opportunities to discuss how that's going and make corrections. If there's somebody who's unaware of how their attitudes or behaviors are influencing the team, the team's ability to produce that product. And then there's a product grade. And I know for many of our projects within courses, in addition to having uh, a final product that gets graded, there are intermediate pieces. And some of those intermediate pieces, we ask the students to produce individually. And so there is some component of an individual grade, even within the project. So for instance, if you are just starting out and you're asking the students to come up with a set of goals and objectives for the project, you can have them do that individually. Um, and then they turn it in and then you you provide feedback and a grade perhaps, and then you hand them back and you say, now I want you to come up with a group goals and objectives. Um, and it should be better than any of your individual ones because now you get four people thinking about this who've already thought some about this. And you know that's kind of beautiful in a couple of ways because you know, the, the key is that the students can immediately, or maybe not immediately, but they get some understanding of why teamwork can be valuable because the product that they come up with together should be better than any of the individual ones if they're really being a team. And when they can see that, um, it gives them more incentive to be uh, more inclusive and produce better work the next time. So that's kind of another way you can get at um, individual accountability as well as, as grading team process. Hmm. Um, but I think there are a variety of ways of doing it. And I suspect we've got faculty here too, who just grade product and, you know, it's a flat grade, but we've, we've also had faculty who do something very much like what you do, Drew, which is ask students to evaluate each other um, and their participation and take that into consideration in the grading as well. Hmm. Yeah. It's interesting to think about parsing the process and product out as separate scores and, one of the things that often comes up in our workshops with teachers is the idea of work ethic, which is somewhat related at least to process. So I'm always a fan of of parsing those things out and thinking, all right, so work ethic is is definitely important, but that is different from learning and the the uh, measurement of understanding and so getting that out as as a separate uh, indicator or metric I think makes a lot of sense as does and we always talk about a heavier emphasis if we're gonna if we're gonna grade and and 
hold kids accountable, but ask them to work in groups, I would suggest, I always suggest saying, you know, something around 80% of an overall grade would be 80 uh, would be an individual grade so that some of those individual pieces that you mentioned along the way formative assessments and and things milestones that individuals and and I tend to think about centering those on understanding of content and learning the the the, the things that we want the learners to think and learn about whether it's your course content or uh, usually it's course content and so sure. that that's like an 80% and then the group product might be something like 20%. So because what we're what we're looking at is producing individuals while we want people to learn how to work in groups and understand how to do that well, we're graduating individuals. So something like an 80 20, 90 10, 70 30 kind of balance seems to help with that, which brings me to the next question and one of the criticisms that I have been sort of pushing back on on social media and other places that I think is is actually it's a perception but there's also some reality there are folks who look at project based learning and constructivist learning and say that it is lacking in real deep learning and that knowledge is not really a focus which I I think if that's the case then you're not doing it well so I'm wondering how you all think about the role of knowledge and understanding in the work that you're doing with your learners that's a great question I I, I agree with you I think knowledge has to be the core the, I think as Mia said that the fundamental um, thing that a project needs to be based on is that it's it's using the the content that you want the students to learn, and um, you know I, I think we both agree that this does not need to be content that has been necessarily taught before. That right. projects are a great vehicle for learning content, and I think it, one of the best reasons that it's a great vehicle is that it immediately gives them the context for which that knowledge is useful. Because, you know, it's like going back to that biochemistry class that I had to teach, you know, we, we memorized um, products, reactants, and enzymes for any number of metabolic pathways. And, you know, that's because that's what biochemists know. Well, but why? The why was completely lacking in the course that I took. And, you know, I, I was able to reconstruct it so that we memorized fewer things, but could focus on the why. Mm -hmm. And so it wasn't necessarily a rote memorization thing as much as the why do metabolic pathways work this way? How do they connect to each other? Which seems way more important than just what's the fourth product of glycolysis, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and it makes the the example I use in our workshops often when I'm running when I'm facilitating one is the pretty typical standard memorization of 50 states and capitals that almost everybody did and memorizing them and and I want to uh, I want to make sure that that I'm not saying that memorizing things is is bad because that does have a role and there are some things you know we want kids to be able to have quick recall of multiplication facts, for example. Sure. Uh, but, so why is it that we memorize 50 states and capitals, and then I usually ask, you know, what's the capital of Wyoming, or some, some place that is not connected to where their, their, their region or location, and you start to see some decay of, of recall there, and then I usually ask, you know, what's the capital of, you know, if we're in Kentucky, Kentucky, and people would say Frankfurt. Oh, well, then why, why do you know that? Well, it's because you use it. You aren't, you, you are using that and connecting in other ways. And so, what I hope that we can move towards with constructivist learning, in a, or away from is, and I do think it's a valid criticism in some cases, is that. Teachers are focusing on the engagement and the fun, and uh, there's a number of ways you might say that, but it's all about student engagement and getting away from this sort of boring, teacher-led didactic that we would recognize as, if, you're, if that's all you're doing, then it is boring. 
Uh, there is a role for some didactic and some lecture and some things in project-based learning, constructivist learning, but it's a dynamic that is shifting. And and we talk about, we're, we're named teach thought, not teach content. And so we want to think about, are we teaching content or are we teaching thought? That doesn't mean you're excluding one or the other, but I think the traditional perspective is to say, we're teaching the content and hopefully they learn some thinking skills. We think teach thinking and use content to do that. And that becomes a much deeper, deeper learning uh, scenario, if you will. I want to bring an example from a very different type of audience from preschool. Right. (laughs) One of the projects that I was uh, involved with um, or led for the last four years is developing uh, Seeds of STEM, which is a a problem-based curriculum for preschool. Um, work closely with preschool teachers um, to, to develop and test uh, the curriculum in multiple classrooms. And um, here is an example of really using that application of learning to solve problems. Uh, so one of the units is about ice and water. And for you know a week or two, the kids really kind of immerse themselves in many experimentations of you know, observing ice and water and freezing and melting and talking about differences between solids and liquids. Um, But not until we have our kind of main character, which is Problem Panda, come into the classroom and really confused or, 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 you know, bothered with a problem because Problem Panda dropped a really valuable ring into water. It was left outside and it froze. Now Problem Panda needs to get the ring out, but um, without harming the ring. So the kids that are by now experts on, um, you know, ice and water and melting and freezing really need to apply everything they learn to help Panda get this ring out uh, without harming it. So really kind of using what they learn about um, about melting and freezing and all the properties of ice and water. Um, in which classroom will they learn, you know, those concepts better and the ones that they just learn and enjoy the experimentation, which is fantastic and important, Um, or um, in that classroom where they had to use the knowledge, whether they learn it before or learning it um, as a, you know, while they um, try to solve the problem, um, I would, and, and I think research backs that, uh, that it is the application of the knowledge to solve problems. So the knowledge, the, you know, the core ideas, as you all said, it, are key, but taking it to the next level and, as Chris said, provide a why we are learning that and what can we do with that um, right away um, is really key for retaining um, and using the knowledge in the future. And I think, you know, this is the age of knowledge. Everybody has an encyclopedia, a dictionary, a map, you know, an answer machine at the end of their hand, right, with their phone these days. So the the more important things that we can help our students garner are how to learn, how to find good information and use it well. And projects are a great vehicle for that. Uh, and I just am reminded of, a, of an anecdote I just told um, my daughter when she was, I think, I don't know, first or second grade, I went to a parent-teacher conference and the um, teacher sat me down and said a bunch of things. And one of them was that my daughter was, had done pretty well on some recent assessment. Um, and then she said, with sort of a disparaging tone of voice, she said, well, I'm not sure how much she really knew, but she was good at using her resources because a lot of that stuff is on the walls in the room. <laughs> and she said it like it was kind of a bad thing. And I went out of there going, all right, <laughs> she knows how to use her resources. That's awesome. Um, and I think, you know, that that's maybe a, a neat way to distinguish between those two. One helps students identify and learn how to use resources and one expects them to just have everything in their heads. I would rather have the person working for me that knew how to use resources than the one who thought they had everything in their head because the world's changing too fast. 
Yeah, it's a really interesting dynamic in how we get kids to take more agency over their learning process. And part of that is that they're in, in, in an ecosystem. And I have daughters 10 and 12 that I talk about frequently in the podcast, but I have conversations with them about their learning in and out of school and, and, and problem solving and asking questions because I'm a big proponent of, of the ability of inquiry to help you really be better prepared for the modern world. But I was having this conversation with my 12-year-old the other day and, and she was talking about her math class. And, and to be fair, I haven't talked with her math teacher about this. So I'm, I'm speaking a, a little bit out of ignorance, but it was more about, about Sadie's response that I thought was interesting in that she was being asked or has been, is being asked to do some practice in math class. I don't know what that math that what that practice looks like and at this point it's not particularly relevant but what she was frustrated with was that she said she doesn't take it up she doesn't even look at it but she gives it to us to do and I said somewhat facetiously but actually pretty seriously said then why do you do it and she said because we're supposed to do it and I said well what would happen if you didn't do it well I might get in trouble well why do you think you're supposed to do it? And of course, at this point, I don't know, you know, is she doing it because it's busy work? I certainly hope not. And if if it were me and I was a student, I would probably not do it. And that's the type of student I was. Now, Sadie is more compliant, but there's, hopefully she's doing it because the the, the practice will help her learn it more deeply. But of course, We want students to take some agency and ownership and say, why am I doing this? And hopefully the teacher would be able to have that conversation with the learner to explain it in a way that does make some sense. And I think this relates back to the authenticity, right? So we're not just doing things and we're we're creating a climate and culture that in a project-based learning scenario or setting is really important in that students are in charge of their learning not the teacher the teacher is there to help support the learners but the, t- the students are able to ask those questions and and other really important questions so i don't, I don't know I, I sort of ramble there but is does that resonate with with you all especially maybe even at the uh, uh mia and the the lower levels the the pre-k elementary levels absolutely and i would say that um, research shows, and I hear that from so many teachers, that by uh, teaching through projects, this is a way to make the learning accessible to all their students. I hear a lot about how the hands-on experience or the, the providing with the why, with the real problem, really brings in those students that um, maybe have not figured out the system and how to get straight A and what it is that they need to do to kind of uh, be successful in the traditional way. But when we ask them to uh, think outside of the box and use tools and be creative and bring their home experience um, to solve a problem, not only they are excelling, but they are also, this is a great way for them to learn content. Um, So I agree with you 100%. And I can tell a story from the other perspective. So in this first year program that we do, it has the projects built into it. We get a lot of students who have come through more traditional back, schooling backgrounds and, and have been taught how to do exceptionally well on tests. And our WPI students do exceptionally well on tests. And they get into this course. and. It's usually the the very high achieving students who will come to us and say, well, I don't know. I don't feel like I'm learning anything. Right. Um, Because they're so accustomed to solving the 30 problems, the 30 odd problems at the back of the chapter or memorizing vocabulary words or whatever it is, this, this stack of information that they have piled up as the I now have this. Right. We call it playing school. Yeah, and, and so when we say, but, but no, you, you are. So one of the things you're going to need to do as a professional anything is give presentations. 
and look how much better you've gotten at giving a presentation and look how much better you are at working in a team. And by the way, those are skills that employers really want to see. And along the way, don't you know something more about food and hunger issues? <laughs> I mean, because we haven't memorized a whole bunch of theorems and we haven't tested you, doesn't mean you haven't learned anything. Right. Um, and you know, that's usually in the first term. And when we get into the, the second where they're actually doing the project work, that sort of dies down because they, they feel like they're um, being productive. Um, but we get so many students who are so accustomed to that um, chalking up of, of facts that they now know that any other kind of learning seems very foreign to them. And, and we've even had some that are even more resistant. Why are you making me do all the work? You know, we're paying your salary. <laughs> right. You should be teaching us. And we're like, no, it's not about teaching. It's about learning. Um, and you have to do that work. Right, right. Well, it's the, the dynamic that we talk about with teachers, and I've written about several times, that we're trying to get at. And this is a shift and I'm, I'm curious in in how you do hiring and what you might look for in your instructors or professors in, in far, as far as uh, attributes and qualities and characteristics mindsets and that kind of thing but I find it a really difficult shift for lots of teachers to make and, and we do several things in our workshops that help teachers make this shift and sometimes you see that light bulb go on and they go wow I was, I was working with a teacher in uh, Minnesota recently a couple of weeks ago and she said I feel like I'm waking up I've I've been teaching for you know 20 years or something like that and this, this makes more sense than I've, you know, it, it, literally she said she felt like she's waking up. So that shift of push from push teaching to pull teaching and project-based learning for us, that's the, the heart of it is that that inquiry piece and that the teacher, instead of the teacher saying, this is what you need to know and I'm going to teach it and I'm going to do all this work and I'm going to, uh, you know, really work hard up here to make sure that I'm presenting that information we're shifting to a pull dynamic where the teacher, the, the facilitator, the instructor, the professor is creating a situation and, and a scenario from which those questions that are important in that discipline or content area uh, and, and let's say this unit are pulled out of students, right? So instead of the teacher, and, and in K-12 we often see them as learning targets or I can statements, how do we get those to be questions that the students are asking? And oftentimes they're, they're, they're teacher questions. They're questions that teachers think are important. So we ask them and they are important, but students don't often care. So how do we shift and ask them to do something that they do find interesting? And, and for us, we talk about that driving question, which drives that, that project that gets them to you, you're pulling those questions and that knowledge and understanding the, the bottom levels of Bloom's taxonomy and that they're doing that work so that to, to us is that big shift and i'm wondering how how you see that or or if it's different for you all and and again coming back to that original question was what kind of things do you look for in the folks that work as instructors or professors so i I have hired a few people to teach specifically into this program. Um, and, and you're right, the ad that we write for those kinds of faculty is pretty different. Um, so, you know, when I advertise that I'm looking for someone who's willing to team teach interdisciplinary subjects where students will do projects, um, you get a different set of people, and I am just going to say they are some of the most wonderful people to work with because they are, they come to you intellectually curious and collaborative and um, excited by new ideas. So those are the people that you really want um, on your team, um, particularly the, the willingness to collaborate. But I, I'm going to give you another analogy that I think has worked, been really effective for us in our work, both with faculty teaching in the Great Problem Seminars, but also for the faculty development we do um, at other colleges and universities. And that is 
thinking of yourself not as the instructor but as the coach mm -hmm. because that's a, a, a perspective that's very accessible to both the instructors and to the students. So a coach would never coach either maybe or the, the director of a play or a musical production or you know, whether it's athletics or any of those, but those are all skills-based. And any of them, this, the, pers the, peep, the students, the, the players, the actors, the whatever, performers, would never consider that they should be watching the coach or the director do everything and therefore know how to do their part. Right. Right. It requires that they do it. So the instructor may show them and then they watch and they make suggestions. No, no, no. Kick it a little harder. or You need to, you know, tense up a little more so you can hit that high note or whatever the instruction is. And then they do it again mm -hmm. and they get them more feedback and they do it again. And what you're doing is developing the skills and abilities of the players and your expertise is required to know what sorts of moves to make to get to that level of excellence, but it's not because you're doing it. Right. You're there with them, helping them get to that place. So you're on their side. I think yeah, this was another shift in my thinking. When I started, I felt very much like a faculty member was in front and the students were facing. Um, you know, I didn't think of it this way at the time, but it sets up sort of an oppositional kind of thing. Right. There's an us and a them. And really, that's the thing that needs to change. You have to get to the point where you're on the same side, working toward the same goals, and everybody's in it together. And I think that is far more effective and productive way of looking at it than, than certainly the way I approached it from the beginning when I first started teaching. Absolutely. And I find it some of the... Uh, most effective teachers for STEM or for project-based are those um, career changers. So people who went to the real world, they had other jobs than becoming teachers and, you know, their calling or other reasons made them um, change and become educators. I think they bring in the big why. They see what their students will need um, when they go out to the world and you know become professionals and they are able to really structure their um, instructions um, to be aligned with the skills and kind of develop students as professional for the future um, you know this is a small minority of, of teachers or educators so some of the ways to encourage other teachers and we have a, a stem certificate course here at wpi where we um, really provide teachers that would like to become fantastic STEM teachers, everything that you know we think they need to know and be able to do. Um, one of the things we do is really uh, connect them with people from industry um, and people from higher education and people uh, from nonprofits um, in a session where those people say, what are the skills um, that they value most? What are their needs? out there in the world. And it doesn't have to be STEM. It can be really any profession. Um, and for teachers and administrators kind of to listen to that, that gives them the why that, you know, there is a world outside of their own classroom. Um, and they are part of a really, really important system that prefers students. And if they know what is um, needed and the skills that are needed out there, then they can do um, their part in their classrooms. And, you know, we have the NGSS and we have standards that emphasize um, skills and practices, you know, state that these are as important as core ideas. Um, but as you all know, it's really hard to shift and change something that you've done or you've experienced as a student, you know, and, and do differently. So guiding and providing support uh, and modeling um, why this is important and how it can be done well, um, I think is is really, really important. Yeah, I think that infrastructure that you mentioned and, and for lots of instructors and teachers, I find that uh, they they struggle 
to find those authentic contexts for their content lots of times because you know pick on math teachers because it seems to be maybe more prevalent with math teachers math teachers are usually trained to be math teachers and they have not often done work in out of out of that context where they're using math so they sometimes really struggle to to find ways authentic ways in which that that math is being used in the real world quote unquote the real world and so that becomes a difficulty for them in ideating projects and connecting them with industry and partners outside of academia i think can be a really important piece there because it does help them shift from what I would say is the shift that that is being an expert to having expertise. And I sometimes talk about that in this in this way to say, I don't even like it when somebody says, oh, we have Drew Perkins here today. He's a PBL expert. What I prefer is expertise because expert sort of means that I know everything. And that is certainly not the case. But when we think about it with students, and I, I like to think I have expertise. So I think about project-based learning and inquiry and teaching and learning quite a bit. And I have asked, I, I think I know some of the most important questions to be asking and thinking about. And so I think as we think about that for students from pre-K all the way through post-secondary, how do we get them to engage increasingly in increasingly more sophisticated ways that an industry or content area expert might? So they're thinking like an engineer, which means that you have to have really a, a fluent, deep knowledge of the content, but uh, there are some other things that go along with that. And so partnering them with some of those folks outside of academia, I think, can be really important. What are what are some of the other things? One of the things you mentioned were resources and budget. And that, that question comes up is in some of our workshops when we talk about what do we need to know in order to, to think about how do we do design and create great PBL. Uh, you know, people will say, you know, we need to know what kind of resources and budget. And I often think that's an interesting question because project-based learning doesn't necessarily, the process of it doesn't necessarily mean you need more resources. What kinds of resources and and things do you think about in that list of resources? It certainly can help, but it's not necessary, like in a K-12 setting, that you need, you know, buses and things. It can help. But what do you think about in that in that context? From from my perspective, um, I think one of the key resources actually is instructor time, because good projects don't just fly down and land on your desk, or you wake up in the morning and go, aha, you might wake up in the morning and go, aha, I've got the seed of an idea for a project, mm. but it takes some real um, significant work. Um, intellectual work and, and time to think about how to develop that seed of an idea into a, a, an effective project. And and the first time you do it, as you're doing it, you go, you know what, it can be better next time because now I know I need to prepare them better this way, add a little more support that way, structure it a little different this way, take a little time or a little less time. Anyway, it, there are plenty of ways you, you discover that you maybe need to tweak this particular project idea. Um, so it takes a few iterations, um, but it requires the, the, that the instructor have the time to think about those things. So I think for me, that's the most significant resource that PBL requires. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely second that. Um, and add that in the pre-K-12 system, it's the time to develop, but also the time to work with, to collaborate with others. And others can be teachers from the schools or other can be um, experts, or should I say people with expertise mm -hmm. <laughs> in, you know, in their field out of education. So really kind of collaborate and learn from them what their needs are, maybe get some guidance. Um, I would definitely say, you know, when I mentioned infrastructure and budget and resources, these were at the institutional level, mm -hmm. not at the classroom level. Okay. And often teachers will say, well, I, you know, I, in order to do STEM well or to do PBL work, we need 
stuff, right? We need the kits and we need um, materials. But, you know, I would say that you can do an amazing STEM project with recyclables and with cardboard. Um, it's really not the money at the classroom level that is needed. It's definitely more the, the time to look through resources, develop your content knowledge, collaborate with others. But at the school level or the institution level, um, I think a budget line that is directed at PBL or directed at um, STEM is really important because it sends a message that this is key thing for us. And if we need to provide professional development for our teachers, we'll use that you know, budget line for PBL or STEM and make sure that the, this is the support they, they are provided with. Um, again, so I, I would differentiate between the classroom level um, mm -hmm. and the institution level. Yeah, and to be clear, I don't think any of us are saying that having those kits and things aren't important or really helpful, but it it it, it really is the the process and the un, what we we think about that uncovering of, uh, uncovering of content and knowledge and thinking through that process. So, I, I did want to before we wrap up and and talk about some of the the things that we want to make sure we mention. Uh, I want to come back to the to the grading pieces and see uh, are there more things that you can share about your grading practices maybe to, and, and to the extent that it goes down more granularly into you know assignments and things like that it, it, we we know that lots of research shows that the the moment you put a grade or a, a points on an assignment or some student work that they tend to stop improving it and so I'm always a big fan of of sort of kicking that can down the road but creating that culture of is this good enough and and that's how we often think about authenticity is or at least one of the ways is not does this get an A or B, but does it meet the needs of our authentic audience? And of course, that's an inquiry point of what, what are the needs? Who are who is our audience? And those kinds of things. But are there other grading practices or sort of ungrading practices that you that you have your 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 folks engaging in that you might want to share? I think one of the things that we recommend is sometimes providing uh, students opportunities to submit things just for formative feedback, no, ungraded, um, because yeah, as you say, grading, you know, there's, it's fraught, um, but giving them feedback and then sometimes, you know, they submit then the next draft and you might grade that, but say, if you want to revise this and resubmit, I'll, you know, I'm, I'm happy to do that. Mm -hmm. You can only do that so often with so many things before you're, you know, overworking your instructors. Um, but, you know, one of the beautiful things that I discovered when we started this first year projects program is um, the question that I used to get most often in my other classes was, um, you know, what do I need to do get to get an A? Mm -hmm. uh, or how many points were, you know, there's all of those grade focus questions completely vanished. The first year, nobody asked me a grade related question at all. Um, they were really much more focused on the project. So I think that the one, for me, one of the best things is the projects really help the students focus a whole lot more on what it is they're doing and not that they're doing something to get an A mm -hmm. or whatever grade they think they want to get. Um, so I, I think for me, that's, that was just a beautiful revelation that it could be just about what it is they're doing. <laughs> right. Yeah. And I would say that according to, you know, assessment literacy, we definitely want to involve students in the assessment process and in their learning process. Um, so defining upfront the criteria for success, explaining why these are important. You know, usually these are derived from the problem um, and trying to solve a problem and, and address the criteria that are set up um, in that scenario. 
um, will be guiding the performance. But definitely thinking, uh, sharing with students what are the expectations in terms of um, skills, in terms of knowledge, in terms of the product um, that they are providing, and um, and engage them in the process, allowing them to self-assess or peer assess um, and providing the bulk majority of the grade really after they had a few opportunities, as Chris said, to, you know, to share it and get feedback and revise it a few times. And the majority of the grade will be really at the end once they are, you know, they develop their skills or improve their skills and get their knowledge, um, you know, to the level that we were hoping for, and this is really a great way for them to show us what they what they learn and what they know. And this is assessment for me. Assessment is really providing students with um, whatever method they uh, can show us what they learn. And I, I want to second the use of peer feedback. Mm -hmm. um, we had, were having a conversation with students once, um, asking them to give us feedback at the end of the course, because you know we've been giving them lots. We wanted to get some from them about the course. And one of the students said, well, yeah, we work, I worked much harder when I knew we were gonna get peer feedback. Hmm. Um, and we said, yeah, and they're like, and the whole class. Oh yeah, they care a whole lot more about what their peers think than what a professor thinks. <laughs> even though we're giving you the grade, well, sure. I mean, it was totally matter of fact. So. Um, there's real power in peer assessment. They will work harder if they know their peers are going to be reviewing it than if it just goes to, you know, the fuddy-duddy behind the desk. Uh, <laughs> they don't really care right. uh, more about the grade, but they, they, they care less about what we think about them right. and more about what their peers think. I'm now imagining that in your, in your interview process, you make sure that you're hiring fuddy-duddies, so... <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm the fuddy-duddiest of them all. I know. <laughs> yeah. um, well, one last question. You've been really generous with your time, and I do want to wrap up here. But how do you, if if you think about you know evaluation and analysis of your project-based learning work, you know when your instructors are doing this work and doing projects. How do you know whether they've gone well or when they've gone poorly? Wow. Um, it's not a question I've thought a lot about. I mean, one advantage I have in particular is they're all team taught courses and the, both faculty are there all the time. So they have each other to do a little peer review. Mm -hmm. And I think it's true for us as well. We, we care pretty deeply about what our colleagues think of us. Um, and they're pretty self-reflective, these faculty. And um, they um, also think very hard about what's going on. And our projects are, you know, different teams are working on different projects. And some of them will go well. And some of them will go not so well. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're evaluating those. Um, so I, I think it, when things aren't going well, it's not so much that the projects aren't going well as the faculty aren't, um, you know, because I, I use a lot of faculty from across campus and some of them are really new to it and they, they don't have quite the spirit of it yet, but it's more that their peer faculty member, you know, sort of helps coach them in the way they should go. Hmm. Mia, so, any, any evidence that you would point to? So I would say um, that just like we want to share clear expectation for students for what a successful project could be, I think uh, teachers, educators, faculty will be helpful for them to have clear expectations of what you know, a high quality course would be. So having, and this is can be created collaboratively. We have a rubric that we use for high quality experiences in, in terms of integrated STEM, um, but just in f immersing themselves in that process, knowing what uh, ex the expectations are and being, as Chris said, very reflective uh, either with themselves or with their colleagues on what they can do better. Um, 
we know that just like everything, you know, you need time. It's, it's a process. Um, so I would say between three to five years to develop something that is really good, it, it, whether it's a PBL course or a STEM program for the school. Um, so it takes time. And as part of the engineering design process or the problem solving process, we know that doing something um, is really just half of the process. The other part is reflecting, testing, evaluating, and revising. Mm -hmm. um, so building that culture of everything can be improved and everything can be done even you know, better than it was, I think is really important to bring, uh, to build in the reflection um, and, and kind of requirement for uh, constant improvement. Yeah. Would, so would you say then at the end of a, of a project that the summit of assessment, assuming you, you're doing some sort of summit of assessment other than perhaps the, the presentation and, and maybe you're not, but that individual summit of assessment of content and, and most, most or all students doing well, reasonably well on that, indicating that they've learned what you want them to learn that would be an indicator of the project doing well or the the inverse being the case if, you know, that summit of assessment shows that students didn't really learn that content that you wanted them to learn, that uh, that, that would be an indicator that you've got some work to do on that project? Um, I, I guess so. I mean, I'm thinking about this from my my great problem seminar perspective. And, you know, it's, like I said, any class is going to, the student teams produce the projects and there will be, you know, as many as 16 of them, different projects. Um, so, and we get student course evaluations at the college level, right? So mm -hmm. one thing I can look at is the student course evaluations. And if they feel like the faculty haven't given them sufficient support and guidance, that may, will be reflected there. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, some of the projects aren't going to go well because of the students themselves. And, and that can't necessarily be a reflection on the faculty. Right. But, um, but yeah, I, I think the individual, the, the grades that come out will um, be reflective of how the students, both their process and their product. Um, but again, you know, when you, tell the students that at the end of their project, they're going to be standing up in front of potentially a large cross section of the university with alumni judging their posters in competition with everybody else in their class. You get a very high level of engagement and pretty good product out. Um, so we, we don't have a lot of issues with students really crashing and burning, except maybe in the teamwork part. Hmm. And, and we do have that, and we've every once in a while had to allow a student to do an individual project because they simply didn't manage working with the team. And then you have to sort of restructure the expectations for an individual project versus one that was completed by a team of three, four, or five. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I would say that a project can always be improved. So sure. it could be that, you know, you have your expectation learning targets in terms of skills and, and knowledge and, you know, you are getting most of them. So it is pretty successful, but maybe you can add, you know, a, a career connection or, or a, a person coming in or professional that you didn't have before. Maybe there is an organization nearby that you could take your students to do field trip. Maybe there is a new video that will you know, help them understand the problem better. So reflecting on the experience and really thinking how this could be even better, I think is a process that um, everyone, every educator should engage in. Yeah, and I think in our Great Problem Seminars, the faculty every year revise some aspect of the course, the way they structure things, um, you know, over the years, We've developed a whole suite of tools that we actually put into a book that came out earlier this year on project-based learning in the first year to specifically, you know, gather up all those resources and make them available to others. All right. 
Well, I want to give you an opportunity to share some of the things that you're doing to further your work. And Chris, I know you have a book and you all have a PBL Institute and some other things, social media and all of those pieces. So if you want to share those now, if, sure. if you would. So um, because as, as Drew said, and I just recently alluded to, um, the Great Problem Seminars faculty recently wrote a book called Project Based Learning in the First Year that is a, it's supposed to be for an audience of instructors that are looking to put project based learning and it and it really explains the value of doing this early in the college career as opposed to just as a capstone. Um, and that recently came out with Stylus as the publisher, also available on Amazon. Uh, in my role as a member of our WPI Center for Project Based Learning, um, we participate in, um, we basically have both a uh, professional development training for WPI faculty, but we also have an outreach component. And every summer we invite teams of educators from higher ed institutions to come to WPI for a two and a half day um, series of workshops where faculty will work on uh, action plans for bringing project-based learning to their campus in a way that fits their context and their students. Um, the center also does um, engagements on other campuses. We, you can invite us and we will come and give custom delivered workshops to your faculty at a time and with the content of your choosing. And you can find out more about those things at our website, which is um, wpi.edu slash plus project-based learning. All one word, no spaces, no capitals. Great. Okay, um, and in terms of the STEM Education Center, I would maybe highlight three um, programs or projects. Um, the first is a kind of a newly um, developed, piloted twice um, STEM education um, or educator certificate course. And this is a three graduate level uh, credit course that can be taken either for credit or for professional development points. Um, it's a five and a half days or that can be done during a Saturday or um, one week during the summer with some follow-ups. And it really, it includes uh, 10 different modules, really covers everything that we think teachers need to know and be able to do, to do STEM well. So this is the STEM Educator Certification course. Um, I mentioned before our Seeds of STEM curriculum, which is a preschool curriculum completely aligned with um, here, the Massachusetts Science, Technology, Engineering Standards for, um, for preschool, but also with the NGSS outcome um, or, or scale expectations um, and includes a lot of uh, common core kindergarten math. Um, it's been tested in multiple classrooms, around 40 classrooms, and is really ready to be implemented. And the last thing that I would love to share is our strategic STEM integration program, um, which uh, is intended not for teachers, but really for education leaders. So teacher leaders um, and administrators from schools or districts that are interested in designing and developing a five-year strategic plan for STEM integration for their districts. So it's a two-year program. For the first year, we work with them on developing the plan. And during the second year, we help with professional development um, and kind of consulting to um, start with the implementation of um, their key priorities. Um, we have many other things going on, but we probably have a short time. So I will share the very quick um, link of wpi.edu uh, slash plus STEM. Um, that will take you to the website or you can, you know, Google STEM Education Center WPI will also take you to our website with all these opportunities. Okay, great. Well, again, I really appreciate your time, and it's always interesting to talk with other PBL practitioners and folks who are helping to, to move that 
ball forward and push the rock hopefully up over the hill at some point but I will make sure to include those links that you mentioned in our show notes so folks who are listening if you're on iTunes you'll have to find our show notes either on wegrowteachers.com or teachthought.com the podcasts are on both of those places but um, Chris and Mia again I really appreciate it and thank you so much for the time well, thank you for so much for the opportunity, Drew. It was really fun. Absolutely. Our okay. pleasure. Thank you so much. That'll do it for today's podcast episode. Thanks again for tuning in. Don't forget to review us and share us on your network so we can grow our audience to better meet your needs. Also, don't forget to find us on our websites, teachthought.com and wegrowteachers.com, as well as our various social media outlets.